All right. Good morning and welcome to the final session of Ignite Sprint. Ignite Sprint, we called it. Uh, and we are uh, we're thrilled uh, at the at the turnout, the attendance and the participation that we've had all uh, year long, <laughs> all year long, uh, and uh, really excited to uh, to have Chris Chase with us today, who is a really outstanding agent and one of the best negotiators uh, that I've ever seen in action. Uh, as he and he does it all very well, from fifty thousand dollar properties in Amherst to one point one million dollar properties in Gates Mill. So he, as they, as the kids say, he's got range. Um, so before I turn it over to him, uh, just a, a few housekeeping items. If you could, to, uh, when and where possible, throw those cameras on, show us those smiling faces. And uh, Chris has forewarned that, that he's going to need uh, some ample participation today. Uh, he wants this to be as much a conversation as it is anything else. So... Latrice, Brian, Kim, Sean, Tamara, Shakita, you guys are in the hot seat just because you're the first people I saw. But make sure that we're leaning in and taking advantage of the opportunity to have the conversation uh, today. Without any, whoop, I was just about to turn it over to him and now he's walking away. So uh, I'll do what I do best, which is kill some time. Uh, and so, uh, now, okay, he's back. Thank uh, God. Sorry. I just knew my daughter was going to start barking. So I had to shut my door. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Chris. Uh, are we, are we still experiencing a little bit of technical difficulties or we think we have it? We are experiencing technical difficulties. All right. Great. Well, um, if you're able to, you sh did you share that with me? Yeah. It's just the, the PowerPoint that I need. Okay. Let me see what I can do here. Coming right up. This is a, I'm a full service host. Uh, I do it all. You know, tell jokes, warm up the crowd, get the cameras turned on. And also, you know, I do the, uh, I do the PowerPoint. My right hand man today. Appreciate you. And I, you, my friend. How's that look for everybody? Well, I can see it. I get a thumbs up from uh, from a few people if you're if you're seeing that. All right, terrific. Take it away, Chris. I'm gonna mute myself. All right. So today we're gonna be talking about negotiations. Um, so every deal we have a few negotiations in throughout the whole thing, right? Um, the first and most important one is getting your offer accepted, especially in this market. So today we're gonna to break down and apply tactics to tackle common points of negotiation. We're gonna analyze and recall counter tactics to make sure the negotiation is a win-win. I'm sure everybody has heard that from anybody at Keller Williams an awful lot. And then we're gonna examine negotiation strategies by the three Ps. Um, those are prepare, present, and position. All right, try to say next, yeah, there we go. <laughs> It's weird not having control. I'm sorry about that glitches. Yeah, we're gonna, perfect. So um, this is where we're gonna first start our conversations where um, these four questions here is, how can your ability to negotiate a deal affect the outcome of a deal? Um, so what I want you to think about is your personal skill with negotiating with other agents, with negotiating with buyers and sellers directly and negotiating um, you know, the inspection contingencies, the appraisal shortfalls, um, how are those going to affect your clients? So anybody have any examples of where their negotiation skills have uh, worked quite well or didn't work? So for the record, if you don't say anything, I'm just going to call on somebody. And I'm going to start with people whose cameras are off. I don't have a specific example, but I do know as a, a newer agent, I'm just under two years. Um, 
I've had to rely on communication skills for negotiation because I know I don't have the knowledge base and the depth. Sometimes I'm, I don't, I haven't known two, three steps ahead what's coming to, to plan for it. I, it's getting better now, you know, but um, so I have found that I've had to rely on what I do have, what skill sets I do have for now, but I'm constantly trying to build my knowledge so that I, I'm coming at it from a whole picture instead. Well, so Kim, that's awesome because one of the topics we were going to talk about there is in when in doubt, um, if you have good communication skills, you're going to be able to keep a deal together. Um, most deals that go bad, at least in my experience and the people on my team's experience, is um, the breakdown of communication. You know, um, I have found even when I, you know, you can always sense when a buyer or seller is mad at you or there's a situation brewing. And once you, you know, break it down and figure it out, it always comes down to some sort of communication lapse or shortfall. So I would say, you know, that's an excellent tactic as you learn more and grow in your business um, because you're not going to get caught off guard, really, if everybody is communicating quite well. Um, well, and then the other, you know, thing is um, what, you know, everybody's had a past career, most likely um, have kids, have family, um, want to buy a car, right? You negotiate every day in your life and you try to negotiate from the position of power, which in the same way is what we're trying to do for our client. Um, at the same time, though, we have to make it a win-win or a negotiation is never going to work. So... Um, next question going out there is, what are some skills that a great negotiators possess? Sean, I'm going to pick on you. I mean, the first biggest one's obviously communication. Um, I'd say confidence is probably a key one as well. I mean, even if you don't know a ton of knowledge, just kind of acting like you know what you talk about is probably a huge thing as well. But um, I mean, those are probably the two biggest things that come to mind for me. Yeah. And, th and those are, those are great. Um, and then the other, it's you know, like I got one. Yeah. I think, um, and I'm not good at this myself, but I believe that good negotiators know when to stop talking. They know when to shut up or they know how to say very little, right. They communicate clearly, but then just stop. And that's absolutely. And, and why do you think that is? I mean, so I can think of plenty of examples where um, my client wanted, you know, we don't hear anything back right away. And they, and they come to me and they say, hey, Chris, you know, go offer them this now or go do this. And I'll say, no, just wait. And they go, well, what do you mean? I said, they're still discussing it. We don't even know what they're thinking right now. And, but they're getting nervous. So normally you hold out and wait for them to talk to you again. And a lot of times you actually get what you want. Um, but if you would have started talking, you would have made more concessions that didn't need to be made. Yeah, I mean, and especially in this market where everything, it feels like it's moving every minute. Like we still have to realize that people want to confer with their spouse or, you know, they want to do the math on their end or whatever. And, and you know, two, three, four hours of not responding, especially if you're representing the, the seller, is, is really powerful. So the, the last one here is um, why is asking questions important when negotiating? And, the, and I want to take that back to the start where the, the best question you can ask your client when you're getting ready to write an offer on every single line item there is, why is that important to you? Because what you're going to find out is there are certain things that are very important that you need to put at the very top. And then there's things that they believe are very important, but really aren't. And you can pivot and change their mind on that. So you can go out there and negotiate for those things that are very, very important to them. And then what I also do is I spin that towards the, if, it, if, I have a buy, if it's the buyer or listing agent, I will discuss with them what's important to their client. And I will take, you know, mix the two things together because that's how you can find the way to make sure you actually get through negotiation. I mean, I'm sure a lot of us have put an offer in on a house that was very competitive and our buyer didn't have to be out of their house by a certain time. So we could leave possession or close whenever they want it to be. 
And just by offering that to the seller and knowing that they need to close on a certain date to get their next house, um, you can say, hey, you know, we'll close whenever you want if you give us this deal. And that's worth money. Uh, most people don't want to move twice. Most people don't want to find a place to rent short term. Um, so that's a very important one to think about. Let's go to the next slide. Um, skip that one. All right. So um, who can throw out a couple common points of negotiation? My favorite is uh, increasing the offer for buyers, especially, you know, we're not going to be, when it's not going to be our final price. So I always tell the buyers, make your strongest offer now, because nine times out of 10, it's not going to be, something's going to come up uh, on the inspection or you're going to find something. So just give them what they asked for to get it under contract. And then we can negotiate from there. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a decent strategy. So what I like to tell my buyers, especially in this market, is what's the most you're willing to pay that if you lose it, you're not going to be upset. And that's the offer that we should start with. Um, because obviously everybody knows that you're not the only person offering on a house right now. And I'm sure, I know, I know uh, Danielle Sutcliffe is on here who's been in multiple, multiple offers and wrote you know, 10, 20 offers for somebody. And it gets really frustrating for the agent and the client to be in those situations. And especially as an agent, it gets really frustrating when they come back and tell you, well, I would have paid more. Well, you should have done that in the beginning because I told you we were in a competitive market. So like you said, you know, um, you, can, you can negotiate some of the other terms later on. You know, we've, instead of, you know, during the inspection contingency, we've removed the inspection, not by any repairs or any money, but by changing possession dates. Um, you know, just getting something out of it that way. Um, anybody else have any important common points of negotiation? You know, um, you know, a couple that I'm thinking of in my head just to get started is, you know, earnest money, giving more earnest money, making earnest money, um, you know, uh, higher, uh, making earnest money non-refundable. Um, you know, saying that you're not going to do, you're not going to ask for any repairs, closing dates, closing costs. One of my favorites, because um, I, when I do my showings, I like to see if there's any going to be any issues in the inspections. Um, that's why I'm like really during inspections, I try to pay attention as much as possible so that I can see the issues when I'm at the showings. And a lot of things that have helped me when offers, because a lot of buyers don't want to say, I don't want to ask or say no repairs. Like I want to have that benefit of being able to ask for something if there's something big, you could say, we're not going to ask for anything below $2,000 or $3,000. And that has won me a lot of offers too. And it doesn't make my buyer uncomfortable. Right. And you know, that's, that's a great one because obviously my majority of my experience is listings. And I can tell you the biggest killer of a deal or a mood for the sellers is a nitpicky um, inspection list. And, you know, oftentimes I've had sellers just say, you know what, I don't want to deal with that. Send a release. Yep. Um, which also brings me to another, um, strong point of negotiation. When you do get that list is I oftentimes will send a removal of contingency with a release and you can, uh, really pressure someone that way to getting what you want or for them to negotiate with you because most people don't want the house to fall out of contract. Yeah, I think, I think you, you, nailed a, you nailed a couple great ones there uh, around still getting your clients access to the information for an inspection. Like if there is, you know, a crumbling foundation or, or a wall that's gonna fall down, you know, they're gonna wanna get out of that deal. But I think coupling it with really understanding and so much of negotiation, Chris, as you said at the beginning, is understanding what your clients want. Um, and so if it's, yeah, like, hey, it needs a new hot water heater in the next two years, don't ask for $500 right now when you're gonna spend 200,000 on the house, just eat it and, and be there. You don't wanna lose the house over, you know, half a percent of the total price. Well, and I think, um, 
That's great because the same token, of, I think a lot of buyers um, overestimate the cost of certain things. Um, you know, like the hot water tank you, you talked about, you know, I, I like to have a good understanding of what something's actually going to cost so I can give them a range so they can think about. Um, I had a first time home buyer say that the new hot water tank was going to cost $5,000 and they couldn't afford that. And, um, you know, and if you go to the average price of a hot water tank to have it professionally installed, it's less than $1,500. And when you can start to say, hey, why don't we call around and get a couple quotes here just before anything happens, before you make a decision. And then they start to realize that things aren't as expensive as they think. So what, anybody else have any uh, good common points of negotiation or some, or some stories of the common points and how they've worked out? One thing that I've done a couple of times is we've given earnest money up front initially and then offered to uh, give additional earnest money once we've had a successfully executed ROC. Um, and that way they're putting more on the line, but not right away. And for first time buyers, especially, it's scary putting a large amount on the line. But if they know, okay, once I'm through inspections, then I'm comfortable with that. So I've done that a few times and it seems to have been effective. Yeah, see, that, that's a great example and actually just reminded me of a situation that I'm in right now um, with one of our luxury homes. So we had buyers come in and make an offer with no inspections, um, my, but, it, but they want to close three months in. My sellers wanted a lot of earnest money down because they didn't want to have the house off the market for three months um, and then have them back out for whatever reason it might be. Because, you know, on a couple million dollar house, $5,000 earnest money, earnest money is not a big deal to walk away from. So what we structure and the, the buyers didn't want to put, you know, $50,000 up front. So what we structured was every month that we're not closed, the buyer owes us another amount of non-refundable earnest money. So basically the seller is getting compensated almost in the form of rent to have their house off the market and to cover their expenses for that house. So it's, it's the outside of the box thinking that gets you to the win-win that gets everybody um, comfortable and happy. And it was the first time that myself or the other agent have ever had a situation like this, um, but it's working out, you know, very well and it's keeping everybody comfortable and everybody on track. Let's jump to the next slide, Mike. Let's uh, jump one more. All right, the three P's. So the first P is prepare. Uh, preparation is key to building confidence and ensuring a smooth negotiation process. So let's, let's talk about what preparation is. How do you guys prepare your client for the negotiation process? Well, I can tell you the first answer. We just talked about it extensively for the last 10 minutes, right? We, we, explained, we explained to them all these situations that can arise, will arise, and uh, get them ready for that. And the most important is, remember, you find out what's important to them. Is it important that they get the best deal possible? Is it important that they move on X date? Or is it important that they find the perfect house and they don't care about the other two things? So the second one is present. Um, that's where we move into the negotiation process by presenting your offer. So we haven't uh, talked to that one to death yet. So let's, what are some tips that you guys do to present your offer um, to the other agent to make it stand out? I yeah, call, I, I call yeah. the agent first and then see what, before I put the offer in and try to get some information from them which I learned from Danielle as well and the team is try to like try to kind of make friends with them be on their side and then as much as I can get and then try to see if my buyer is willing to do those things or were you willing to put those things in the offer and put it in that way absolutely so as you're as you're doing that you know whether some of the questions that you ask right are hey when does your seller need to move um where are they moving to Right. What are some of the I asked the question, I said, what are some of the things that my offer should include that's going to make us stand out? 
you'll be surprised at what the agent on the other side will tell you. I mean, they'll tell you everything that they know about their client to get the deal done. And if you, and again, it's just like negotiation. If you just sit back and listen and ask them the same questions, why is that important? You know, um, they'll tell you everything you need to know most of the time. And it, and then I just, I take that back to my client and we make our offer um, reflect that. Um, so you had a great point where you want to call first and have that conversation. Um, then once the offer is prepared, you submit it, always call a second time and say, hey, I have submitted the offer. Um, do you want me to go over it with you or do you want to call me once you've looked at it? And make sure you have that dialogue. Because two things, what we started in the beginning with, it's communication. Um, no agent wants to work with someone who thinks that they're not going to communicate. Even the worst agent communicators still want to work with an agent that communicates. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten offers just emailed to me and I've never spoke to the agent. So I've obviously ignored those um, a lot of the times and reach out to the people who have talked to me first. And we start there. What do you do when you get an email that just says C attached? <laughs> <laughs> Very, I, I will tell you that obviously we look at every offer, but when I discuss these um, with my clients, I will tell them that I got an email that just said C attached with no communication from the listing agent or buyer's agent. And that makes me nervous for the completion of a transaction. And most of the time, right, you, the clients have hired you because they believe that you're the expert. So if you give them advice like that, they're going to lean away from it. I mean, unless it's, you know, 30% higher than every other um, offer. Well, then obviously you got to figure that one out. Um, any, anything else that anybody does special um, in presenting their process? I haven't called a second time after I submitted. I like that idea, but what I typically do is I'll put a little cover note with it and I'll just so, you know say, hey, here's some of the, the key points or the strengths of our offer and uh, you know looking forward to working with you, that kind of thing, and just try to reinforce that communication will be there. Yeah, a cover note is great, right? That's a that's a great way to you know have everything right in front of them. Um, but like you know, we talked about. I would always recommend even after that, just call and just say, "Hey, I want to make sure that you got it." I mean, that's 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 as far as that conversation really needs to be. Um, but it just shows that you're in tune. And then the uh, last one is position. That's move both parties close until you have a full agreement. So you know. This is the step where your offer is submitted, they're reviewing it, and they're giving you a counter offer. Um, you know, the, the counter offers can be simple dates, they can be um, possession, closing, amount of money. So the, those are those are things that um, you know they're getting from their client and they're bringing back towards you. Does how does anybody prepare their client for a counter offer? Just going to call on someone. Brian. No, I think you just have to tell them um, what could be involved in the counter offer and what are the strong points? What are the weak points? What could they come back to you with? So does anybody ever have a client surprised that they got a counter offer? I'm going to assume no. Um, yes. Yes. All right. And, and why were they surprised? Well, because the counter offer was over the asking price and they was like, well, the market is great. So we think we can get even more. And it was like $5,000 over, over the listing price. I mean, so I did not know like how to really go about that. I mean, I don't know. Were you, I'm just curious, were you asking for closing costs? Um... I don't know. I never said anything about the closing costs. Um, we just put in a bid and then they countered over the listing price. Okay. Yeah. So, right. So how do you prepare your, you know, your, your client to expect that, which it's, it blindsides you, but it, it does happen. You're not the first person that's happened to um, so one thing that I would always start in the beginning and the um, even in the buyer counseling interview 
which if anybody is asking what's a buyer counseling interview, you should be doing those. Um, as I prepare them for what to expect, I say, hey, you know, we're going to submit an offer and they could counter. Um, they're most likely going to counter. And even if you have a full price offer, they're still, they still could counter depending on, on the offers that they have already received. Um, Cause that's probably what happened. They probably got a couple other offers that were at that price or a little bit more, but there were other terms in your contract that they liked. So they probably brought yours up to try to make it the best offer. All right, anybody else have any uh, any stories or questions about the counter offers? I actually, um, mine's a funny one. You know, Sam, uh, I had a house listed for 170. We agreed upon it with my list or my seller and ended up getting a offer at 177, so seven grand above. And my seller said no and countered at 185. So how would you handle that? Because that was a tricky situation for me. <laughs> Yes, that's a tricky, I mean, I remember trying to handle the situation when it was happening to you. Uh, <laughs> you know, unfortunately, right, there are some times where people, you lose control of people because, you know, they're, they're out there. Um, the question that I would ask, though, is why did we list the house in the first place? You know, what was your desire to sell it? And why do you think it's worth more than the highest offer that you got? and try to see what, just try to get an understanding of where they're coming from. And, um, you know, Danielle's situation is not as common as people might think. That was kind of a one-off for to, to go that, um, that wild. Sam, was that Sam in Lakewood? Sure yeah. is. And he's trying to <laughs> keep the list again. So that's fun. Oh, <laughs> but, that's great. Yeah, but I'm normally fine. there there's an underlying reason that they're doing that. Um, maybe they got a big bill recently, you know, whatever it might be. But the key is to try to understand and figure it out. And then the final piece of that puzzle is to also understand that sometimes a deal is not going to work. Yeah, Chris, I, I got one that I think, you know, you talk about the buyer consultation, you talk and, 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 and how important that is. We're doing a live buyer consultation training on the 27th, um, which will be really good. Um, but related to that, or even for your sellers, like making sure they understand what a counter offer is. Because a counter offer is actually two things happening simultaneously. You're rejecting and terminating the first offer, and then you're putting a new offer out there. Uh, has anybody ever had a client counter offer, get the counter offer refused, and then be like, well, we'll just go back and take the first one? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> That's not a thing. Right. But the good news is, right, if, if the people still want the deal, it can happen. But there's no obligation anymore. As soon as they send you a counter, the, like Mike said, the first deal is, is done. The first offer is, is, is no longer valid. Um, so has anybody ran into an experience like that where the, then they say, we'll take the first offer. And then that person says, no, I already bought another house or I'm already on a contract on a new one um because that has happened <laughs> no anybody know what they would do in that situation i would like to know <laughs> go, back, go back to trying to get the house sold to somebody else at that point <laughs> yeah i mean so the first thing that i would you know because obviously we do what our clients tell us to do in these situations um, so if your client put you in a position where you, you know, rejected an, uh, encounter offer and the person said, no, we don't want the house anymore. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to call the agent and apologize for everything that's going on and just say, Hey, you know, what can we do to keep the deal together? Um, and see if there is anything you can do. And if there's not right, you just go out and you find another, um, you know, you find another, uh, buyer or seller. And at the same time, you then have to counsel your client on why that happened. Because um, most of the time, if it happens, it's because they went against probably some of the advice that you as their agent offered. Um, you know, instead of you probably said, hey, you could probably get another 2,500 bucks out of them. And they said, okay, let's get 25,000 out of them or something on that, that kind of made it 
feel to the other person like they're now negotiating in bad faith. That's usually when people walk away from the tables when they feel like it's being negotiated in bad faith. Like Danielle's client, the buyers obviously walked away from that because they already offered way over asking price. And then the seller comes back even more. They have a bad taste in their mouth. Even if you got that deal back together, it's not going to be a um, comfortable close. Everybody just be waiting for the next shoe to drop or the next, you know, asinine ask. Well, let's jump to the next. All right. So we're going back to the first P and a lot of these things we've discussed. Um, I'm sure the people that are on the chase group with me will understand the last one is my biggest pet peeve. It's know the documents inside and out. Um, as a professional, it's our obligation to know the contracts. It's also our obligation to know and understand every other brokerage's contracts that gets put in front of us so that we can accurately explain them to our clients. Um, obviously, I don't think I need to tell the group in here that we have to obey the law. Um, so make sure you do do that. <laughs> no, I think it's good to stress that. Just to hold <laughs> Okay, obey the law. <laughs> Um, you know, if, if you ever have a situation where you have to ask yourself, should I do this or should I not do this? The answer is you should not do this. Um, that's your conscious talking. Don't do anything that breaks the law, violates your license, is going to get kicked you out of real estate. So, um, but the other ones obviously are, are very good as well. You know, know your goal, um, know what they want. No, what and the goal isn't just to buy or sell their house it's you know to move to a new area to be closer to their grandkids it's to the the reasons why they're doing everything um it's you know i need 30 day or i need 30 days after close to get into my new house because i'm building um that's the goal um know your client is just knowing them personally on a way of what makes them tick so that way you can try to anticipate what's going to be important to them, where they're going to get it hung up, where they're going to get hung up from. Um, how do you need to explain your documents to them? You know, if you have an engineer client, you're going to have to go through and make sure that you know every detail of every single thing and explain that to them precisely. Whereas some other clients, you know, hardly will even look at anything. So you just have to kind of give them the overview of what they need to know and what's the very important things. Um, think ahead is huge for negotiation tactics. Um, I always like to figure out what the next move of the other side is going to be before it happens and prepare my client for that. Um, for a seller, it's once we're having the inspection, I let them know that they're going to come at us for something from the inspection because they always do. Um, they're spending $500 for an inspection. So you No, they want to get $500 out of you for something. Um, just be prepared. Um, every house has something wrong with it. So every single seller says, my house is perfect. You know, I know everything about it. They're not going to find anything from the inspection. Well, yes, they are because they hired a professional to find problems with your house. They will find a problem in a brand new built home that just passed every single permit process from the city. From you know, They'll still find a problem with it because that's their job. If they didn't, they wouldn't have a job and they wouldn't get hired. Um, and then, you know, we talked about this a little bit, but it's, it's setting very clear expectations. Um, you know, the counter offers expect it, you know, um, like I said before, the inspection contingencies expect something, um, always be ready to, for what's going to happen next and make sure that your client is coached that way. So they're never caught off guard. As soon as they get caught off guard, they start, um, negotiation, no, negotiating from, not a position of power from a position of weakness. And once you do that, that's when things really start um, getting away from you. Anybody have any questions on any of those or any comments? Before we go to the next slide, I'm gonna just say one more time is know the documents inside and out. As a new agent, you have no excuse to not know your documents you're not busy yet. So you can sit there and read through every single document, know what it is. You know, we've even made um, our team members in the past write out purchase and listing agreements and then even break down bullet points of what they just read meant. It's very important that you do that. And that we weren't doing that 
you know, to be mean, we're doing that because if you know everything that, that you're talking about in there, one, your client is going to love you because you're going to be the expert. Two, you're going to stay out of real estate jail. No one wants to get sued. Yeah, I think a very a very powerful exercise that I went through when I first uh, first started was you take the contract, you read it, and then you you rewrite it in layperson terms, right? Or a couple bullets. Like if your client asks you, "What is Megan's law? And why am I? Why do I have to sign on it?" You know, you want you want less than twenty five words to explain what Megan's law is and, and why it's in the contract, right? What's the, you know, what's this thing, right? Because every, every line of the contract gives you leverage, gives you power. But as, you know, as Chris said, when you get those engineers or those high C's or accountants that are just like, what is this? What is this? What is this? You want to have a response to everything. And if you do it once, you've done it for every contract you'll ever write. That's really, I, really good advice, Chris. Mike, on that point, um, I actually just last week gave my entire team, I sat and wrote out, uh, a synopsis of every single paragraph of our, our offer. And we now, I always have included it in my buyer console um, just so they have it on hand. And now the entire team does. I think it's a really great tool because they can just go back and look at that when they don't understand something and not have to ask me. And I always point out our admin fee in, in that um, synopsis too, so that they have it in writing and they can't come back at me and yell at me for having an admin fee. <laughs> That's smart. I like that. Um, well, I mean, that's, let's jump to the next one. All right. So everybody knows the difference between open-ended questions and closed-ended questions, right? As salespeople, we don't like closed-ended questions. Um, as negotiators, sometimes closed-ended questions are important. Um, most of the time, I want to do open-ended questions because I want the other person to talk, 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 talk. Um, once someone starts talking, they will tell you everything you want to know, and you can steer that conversation in any way that you want. And that goes for your clients. It goes for the um, the other agent in the transaction. They'll tell you everything. So, um, but a big, you know, a couple of big ones that they have here are what's some additional information I should know. Um, those questions, you know, I, I try to get those answered like do you have a second mortgage on the house do you owe someone else money as a payoff on the house um i try to get them to answer it there because it sounds less like i'm interrogating them if i don't get that answer i will then go and ask that as a closed-ended question um that's something that i have ran into a lot is i make someone a net sheet and i find that they have their first mortgage i ask them about their mortgage i have their payoff on it and then i come to find out that they borrowed a hundred thousand dollars from a family member on the house that they need to pay back if they sell it. And uh, now we're underwater of some sort of nature or they're mad at me because I didn't know it. Um, so that's why you wanna make sure that you get all these answered up front before you go and negotiate on their behalf. Um, anybody have any good um, open-ended questions or closed-ended questions that they ask their clients? Not really a question, Chris, but anytime that I ask a question and I get an answer that is insufficient, um, and I apologize for anybody on this call who's been on the receiving end of this, I always just say, tell me more about that, right? Yeah. Or, or um, how did it come to be that way, right? Like, and, and just, it, it's a nothing question, right? It's a trampoline question where you're just jumping up and down, you're not moving anywhere, but they, they, it keeps them talking, similar to a negotiation, your initial con or your initial consultations with your clients are just like, Hey, tell me more about that. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, my, one of my favorite ones is always, why is that important to you? Um, and it's, everyone is a, a variation of that, but you're just digging deeper to the next level. Um, I forgot which Keller Williams training it was, but it's the seven layers deep, right? You want to get every, every layer, peel off more, peel off more. So you can actually figure out what their motivation is or what the true answer is. Um, you know, I people have been dead set that I need a house with a basement. And you, you break that down and you find out that they don't need a basement. They just need additional storage. 
um, an oversized garage would do it. So it's just, but they don't even, they don't even know that yet until you figure out why and then can solve their problem for them. So, all right. So all of these questions do a, a, a vital point and is they provide us with points that we're gonna negotiate on. Um, that's why they're very important. They're very important for you to understand these so you can help your client the best that you can. And then on all of these things, um, one thing I like to do is I like to under promise and over deliver. So, you know, if I find out what's important to them and I, I, I rank them and then I say, hey, I think we can probably get this top one, not a problem. And then I like to go out there and get them, you know, two or three of them and make them really happy and really happy with the service. And you can do that if you're in good communication. See how we went back to communication like every single slide. Um, so let's, uh, let's jump to the next one. Yeah. So what would happen if, and why is that important to you? See, it's almost like I knew what the next slide was going to be. Um, <laughs> so yeah, let's just, let's jump to the next. All right. So ask questions to clarify and set clear expectations. So we, are, we already mentioned this, right? We, we, if we don't set expectations, they will be set for us and against us. And once they're set for you, you'll never live up to them. Um, all right. I think we have a scenario here now. Let's make sure here. Can you say that again, Chris? I really, if you don't set expectations, they'll be set for you. Correct. And you'll never live up to, you'll never live up to them. I like that. I like that a lot. Right. They don't have a workbook or anything, do they? We, we, no, we've been, we send out, we'll send out the slides as follow up, but. Okay. Yeah. Cause like half of these is to fill out the workbook. So let's, let's skip. All right. The last, you know, the, the present and the learn is when we're actually taking that contract to negotiate it. So like we talked about, um, you want to pay attention to the verbal cues. You want to really, the nonverbal cues are hard because most negotiations now are done over phone, email, text message. Um, I like to get them on the phone just for the reason that I can pay attention to verbal cues since I can't get nonverbal cues through the phone or through email. Um, here's the big one, like we talked about earlier. Um, once, you, once you present your offer, you keep quiet and you let them talk. Um, Obviously, we listen to what's important to the other side. Um, and like um, we said before, like Laurel, he, he was calling them and finding out what was important to the other side before he even writes the offer, which is fantastic, right? Because now your offer already can reflect what they want and you're already going to start lowering their guard. They're already going to, you know, getting to feel more comfortable. You're going to have a leg up on that um, negotiation. Um, a huge important one is to stay calm and relaxed. Um, I can't tell you how many times that tempers flare um, in these situations, especially because we are the middlemen of this and sorry, middlemen and women of this um, middle people. Yeah. So we have a client on one side. We're here. They have a client on this side. They're here. Um, we're all doing what our client tells us to do. If your client can start being, you know, irrational um, that's usually when tempers start um, coming up. We have to remember that the other agent is just representing their client. Um, and I know I sometimes want to get not calm anymore when the agent doesn't want to communicate. Um, that really starts, you know, firing me up. And then, but that, you just focus on what your customer needs is the next one. But that's always what brings me back to earth is I just say, you know what, I have to do my best job for my client and I can't say what I want to say. Um, obviously, if you make the other agent mad, did you give your offer the best chance? No, you didn't. <laughs> Anybody have a good example? These are always the fun ones of when the, um, staying calm and relaxed wasn't happening anymore. Latrice does. She's nodding. <laughs> Let's hear it. <laughs> I 
Okay, so this was a while ago. It was before I moved to Las Vegas. I'm back. Um, wow, it was back in 2017. It was in November. And it was my last closing before moving out of state. So I wanted to get it closed and you know have everything finalized and not have to be in a different state, still doing real estate practices here in Ohio. I had an agent who, I mean, this, and, and it was on my buyer completely, <laughs> but I had an agent who completely had emotions involved as a listing agent because my buyer wasn't um, compliant in regards to the things that he needed to do to get closed. Um, I told her that as agents, we have to set whatever emotions or feelings that we have aside so that we can come together and put and brainstorm and put our minds together to get the deal closed. So, you know, once she realized that she was bringing emotions into it and then she stepped back, it just became a better, um, a better situation to get, you know, even my buyer involved and back on track versus, you know, the route that she was taking, which was like, I understand she's getting all that emotion from her seller, but, you know, we have to keep our heads clear so that we can brainstorm and problem solve issues and get the deal closed. Yeah, see, that's awesome. You, you know, you had the wherewithal to, to, to tell the agent, you know, obviously appropriately, um, hey, you know, we got to calm this down. We got to put our emotions in check and, you know, great, good on her because it sounded like it worked, um, which, you know, a lot of times when you tell someone to calm down, if you do it wrong, they're going to do the opposite of calm down. <laughs> yeah how often does that work right <laughs> yeah. all right let's jump so, to the next slide of real position quick, Chris, i, oh, I yeah. want to I, I just want to ask you because i know you've you know done well you know hundreds of deals and 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 you know you're teaching this class because you're good at it i, I think there's something in like pop culture or on tv you know if you watch billions or succession you know there's this sort of like representation of the way negotiation takes place, right? We're gonna pound the table or we're gonna do something sneaky or we're gonna play hardball. I mean, in all of the deals that you've done, how how many times has it been like what you see represent, represented as negotiation on TV? Once. <laughs> yeah. I can, I can tell you though, that anytime that I am talking to another agent and I can tell that they're getting frustrated or upset. And uh, I know that I have won, if that is a weird, because if you stay cool, calm and collected and keep your head clear, you can walk the situation anywhere you need it to go. Um, when the agents or the clients start getting upset and aggressive, um, normally you can point that out and start calming it down. And a lot of times, um, you know, I always ask them, I say, is everything all right? Like, what's going on with you? Like, bring it, I bring it back to earth on them. And most of the time they feel embarrassed. And uh, then they want to make up for that. And you kind of have, you can pretty much sneak in and get whatever you want to get out of them at that point, because they're embarrassed. Um, I do have a short story of the worst negotiation that I have ever been a part of that I almost left real estate over because I was going to have a massive heart attack. Um, I made a mistake of, I had a, um, it was a pretty nice house in Redtail that I was the listing agent and the buying agent on um, with clients of mine who trust anything that I say or do. And we were, we sold the house to someone moving in from out of state. They did a home inspection. We were letting them move in two weeks early and renting it back before the house closed, which was also a huge mistake. I don't ever recommend anybody doing that. Um, the One of the people were was an attorney. And um, once they moved in, they found, it was a three-year-old house, by the way. They found every single flaw they could in the house down to possibly a paint not matching on two different walls and wanted it fixed, wanted it fixed, wanted it fixed. Um, everything was just going south. I was the only person involved trying to negotiate with them. Um, and they were just rude and disrespectful. And uh, it finally sent me to my boiling over point. And I got upset. Um, 
I yelled, I was unprofessional. And I sat back down and said, you know, I can't handle this. Um, so I went to our team leader and said, hey, like I have to tag out. Um, I've lost my professionalism. I've lost my cool. Um, you know, I'm, I'm probably calmed down enough now that I'm fine, but I just know that it could happen again and it's not the right thing to do. So I removed myself from the situation, which is what should be done if you ever do get in a situation where you can't stay calm and relaxed because you're not doing the best service for anybody anymore. Um, in my defense, that whole transaction had to be end, or had to be um, solved with attorneys. So um, <laughs> it was, but it closed. So, all right. So learn, right? When we want to find out the buyer wants to close in 60 days, the seller wants to close in 30 days. How do we solve that? Who's got an example? I'm just going to call on someone. Just scrolling through. I bet Nancy has a good example of that. He always does. Oh, no. Um, I would say, what about the buyer wants to close in 60 days and the seller wants, how about a rent back? Oh, he wants to close earlier. Seller. Um, if it was reversed, I'd say rent back. Does the buyer want, buyer wants to close. Uh, I'm not the negotiator on my team. <laughs> force everyone else to do it <laughs> well so right but a 30 day what i said the, the the first thing that i would always ask right is to the buyer why is 60 days important uh, right. do they yes, have a house not. to sell right do they have a house to sell do they just not want to be in the house at that point and the seller wants to close in 60 so or 30 so one way to do it is like you talked about though i mean it, it, it is in a way a rent back you have you figure out well the buyer doesn't Want, he can't move for 60 days from out of state, but there's no problem closing in 30 days. He just doesn't want the house to sit vacant. Mm -hmm. So you could provide some sort of, um, okay, well, let's, we're going to close it in 30 days for the seller, but the yeah. seller can stay for X amount of dollars um, per week uh, for the, the deal to happen. Um, and they're even doing, Chris, they're even doing free. Right. They're oh, yeah. We've been free we've, today, allowing the seller in order to get the deal. Right. I did, we just had a buyer um, let the seller stay for three months free. Yeah. So they, yes, so they can get the, the property. <laughs> uh, what, I mean, it's such a great example of like, you know, price aside, right? Like people, people don't move for the sake of moving, right? It's birth, death, marriage, divorce, promotion, demotion. So they want, they want to be out of there in 30 days because something's finalizing. Right. And, and so that, and once you understand that, you know, it, your buyers are like, Oh, okay. It, there's a divorce and they, you know, it needs to happen right now. Okay, great. Well, not great, but you know, it makes more sense when there's a human element behind it. Well, Absolutely. And one of the things that I've actually found in a similar situation to the one on our screen where the buyer didn't want to close for 60 days was because they didn't want to make a mortgage payment for 60 days. So what I had them do was talk to the lender and have the lender explain how you don't actually pay the mortgage on the first month you close. So then they end up going, oh, well, if I don't have to pay for that first month, well, then I don't, that's fine. We can close. Um, so that's just finding out what the real issue is and what the underlying problem is and then solving it. I mean, that's basically our job, right? It's asking the right questions and then solving the problem. That's, yeah, we beat that horse to death there. So let's jump to the. Yeah, we don't have a participation guide, right? All right, counterattack it. All right, there's, so we're not gonna break off into groups. We're just gonna continue discussing it. So, um, there's a situation, which neither of us have the situation. Well, let's just, let's just go with one, right? What's, yeah. uh, 
what's a uh, uh, and, and this is this is uh, putting forth or uh, receiving a counter. This is putting forth a counter offer, right? Correct. Okay. Um, so I mean, let's say that um, you know you get an offer comes in slightly below asking price or asking for closing costs as well. All terms and conditions are pretty flat, right? And, you know, how are you drawing up a response to something that, you know, your seller's like, ah, this feels a little soft. It feels like a little bit of a soft offer. Like they're almost inviting a counter. <laughs> Yeah. So, right. I mean, there. you can, ex so what, first thing that I always do is I explain to my client what they can do, right? You, you can, you can accept, you can deny, you can counter. Um, I give them their options and most of the time, right. We want to counter. Um, so then we start talking, we start talking about how we can reasonably counter, at least I do to them. And one of the things that I usually know, because I've talked to the agent on the other side is if there is more room or there isn't more room and I will tell my client, Hey, their agent likes to talk. And they told me that this isn't their best offer. So I think we could get X out of them more. And so we, I think we should counter that. But then I, I also point out, hey, what's more important right now than money is do the dates make sense? I like to try to throw everything at up front. You know, I don't want to negotiate price um, and then come back and try to negotiate dates. I want it all to be right up front as one whole contract. So that way we're not going back and forth. Um, if we go to the next slide quick, Mike, we'll show some terms that they that they use for it, right? which is the hot potato, which is where you're just going back and forth, negotiation, 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 um, which really can start wearing out your clients. So have everything right up front. Um, the good guy, bad guy, I'm still not even grasping this term um, to, to the, the full on point because it's just a bad, I mean, you, you want to be the good guy throughout the whole process because you're going to get more. Um, so you want to test the validity, find out if the problem is real and has the party with the problem exhausted every possible solution. So one question is, you know, okay, well, they want three months possession. Well, why do they want three months possession? Um, you know, did, did they look at short-term rentals? Did they look at all these different solutions that you could have? What about getting into their new house early? Like, let's figure out how we can help the other side before we actually do a negotiation tactic on it. Um, so so important to remember that the co in co-broke stands for cooperating, not competitive. <laughs> You're not competing against the other person to to, to see who's the the be, you know the best agents close deals, right? Right. Well, I mean, it's we run into situations all the time. I mean, I was just in this uh, situation where my sellers needed more time in the house after the closing date. Um, the buyers needed to move in right away. So while I worked with the cooperating agent, we figured out that the people buying the buyer's house that were buying my, you know, three lines back, we went to, got that agent involved and figured out that those people actually have a second home. So they went to their second home, which allowed my client's buyer to stay in their home just a little bit longer, which allowed my seller to stay in their home just a little bit longer so they can get into, so they can move once into their new home that's under, con, you know, it's closing right now. So, you know, it, it, it would have blown the deal apart if we wouldn't have been good at communicating and went all the way back to figure out the answer. And the great thing was there was three good real estate agents involved who were good at communicating to get this done. You know, as you know, right, every single real estate transaction is probably a domino to something else. Um, the nibbling, call them on their game if it continues, then attribute what the bad guy says to the good guy since they are a tag team anyways. This will likely diffuse the tactic because you now have two bad guys. And that's the point of that is if someone's trying to do a, you know, a bad guy, good guy approach on you, like I told you before, you call them out on it. You ask them if everything's okay. You know, why are they upset? Why are they being angry? 
And most of the time that's going to diffuse the situation because if they're trying to play a tactic on you, that doesn't work. Um, if they were stressed out, they've realized that, Hey, I do need to calm down to get this done. Chris, can I ask you uh, just a, a, a strategy question? Um, I've heard some people say at, at homes of a certain price point or in certain markets, you should expect to go back and forth three times, right? Oh, we should, you know, if you're going to put the ROC out there, you know, it's going to go back and forth two or three times before. I mean, do you subscribe to any of that? Or is it like, look, know what your client wants, get the deal done. I don't care if it takes one try or 10. Yeah, I don't, sub yeah, I don't subscribe to that. Okay. Um, it's, and the, and the reason why is I pr personally, I prepare my clients, whether they're buyers or sellers, to get what we want and to get it right away. Um, and, and by that is I tell them what to expect. I tell them when we do, when we send over this ROC that's this long, I can say, hey, just so you know, they're gonna focus on the important stuff right here, or we're gonna assign X dollar amount to this whole thing and ask for that. Um, and that's what we're gonna stick with. And then, and I, and I have found though, it doesn't really matter the price point. Um, you know, people, a lot of people say, oh, the higher end homes, you're going to deal with a lot more stuff. Not really. Um, what I find is the higher end homes, they actually trust their agent more than a lot of the other, some people, and they just tell you to handle it. Um, where when an ROC comes through, you just say, hey, you got to hire a handyman to fix this. And sometimes we have, we'll fix the whole ROC just to keep everybody happy in the deal moving. And the, the buyer will feel, oh, hey, I'm winning. I didn't beat them. Whereas the seller side, you know, we already got what we wanted for in, in terms before um, with terms or price. And we expected this. And it was just part of the seller being prepared for the counter. You know, that's that's the key. You know, it's like, again, it's, it's setting the expectations. You know, there's, there's a couple of key points that we've came back to every single time. And it's communication, um, setting expectations, and, you know, just always doing what's right. And then knowing your documents, that's the one I'm going to stick with forever. So, yeah, I mean, as, as we kind of sit here, we can leave it on this slide here. It's, um, we're wrapping up at the end here. So I want, I want to finish off with, you know, if anybody has any, you know, aha moments um, from this, if anybody has any questions, um, comments about experiences that happened to that, them, or, you know, maybe how someone else on this, you know, Zoom right now would have handled the situation. Um, Chris, I have had um, a few realtors, not a lot, um, act like big shots. I don't, I think they might have been listing agents and we were negotiating and they get testy with you, like nasty. And I would say to them, so-and-so, Susie, uh, this is not about me or you. This is about a seller who wants to sell and your, my, my buyer who wants to buy and your seller who wants to sell. And we need to get out of the way. And I, I, they become my best friends after. They're so weird. Well, you know, it, it goes back to grade school, right? Where, yeah. where bullies are bullies until they're yeah. called out. Yeah, and then they're not really them. bullies, right? Yeah. And obviously you chose the absolutely most appropriate way to do so. Um, you just you just tell them what they're doing is not appropriate and it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. And then most of the time, I think that I generally like to believe that most people are good and most people just have a bad day and we catch that bad day. And if you point that out to them, they again, they get embarrassed and go, oh yeah, you're right. Maybe, maybe I was being a little too hard on that. Um, so, and it's, but it is funny though, because you're absolutely right. We have a job and we have a buyer who wants to buy and a seller who wants to sell. Let's work together and make that deal happen. Um, like Mike said, the co means we're cooperating. Um, and that's, that's the most important part about it. What other uh, comments, ahas, questions? Anybody gonna do anything different? This time, you know, the next offer they write, which I'm sure is going to be today. We're going to call about um, negotiating. I mean, I don't even 
I'm just really new to everything, but how do you negotiate closing costs? Like, what's a good way to do that? Well, I mean, for the buyer, for the buyer, right? So, I what I like to to start off right as I find out from the lender how much closing costs do they need? Um, what's what's the what's that max number they need? Um, and I write that you know, obviously into the purchase agreement. And I, and I make it very clear in the purchase agreement. I make sure that I tell the other agent that, hey, we need closing costs. In a competitive market like we're in right now, um, I will also then advise my buyer that they should raise their purchase price by the closing cost amount. Um, so, and then I, I tell the seller that I say, hey, you know, we're offering you full price plus the closing costs that we need. And um, that keeps you the most competitive because what's the difference if I offer them full price and you offer them full price plus $5,000 for closing costs? Um, it's the same net to the seller. So you're still, you're not at a disadvantage yet. Um, and most of the time, you know, appraisals, we don't, you know, I don't see them at least um, not cover closing costs. You know, if, 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 if there's an appraisal gap, it's usually, you know, $10,000, $20,000 these days. It's not the $4,000 the, the buyer needed for closing costs. Um, I'm not an appraiser, but a lot of times I assume that's just the appraiser pushing that part through because they see it's for closing costs. Um, so that's just the best way to do it. And just, you know, just to be upfront that you need closing costs um, and let them know why you've offered the offer that you, you, you did. Does that help? Or did I just ramble too much for you? <laughs> no, that helped. I mean, everything is still not clicking all the way because it's just new to me, but it does help though. So I would advise, you know, for you being new is um, find an agent in your office, someone that you're comfortable with and talk to them about when they're writing an offer and sit there with them while they write it and while they um, talk to the other agent and have them recap if you're not with them when they do talk to another agent, just to try to see how the process is going through. Okay. And okay. I know that, you know, everybody in, on this, you know, greater metropolitan wants to help. That's why we like it here. Okay. Thank you. Chris, one of the, one of the things that I, I think you, you reiterated a lot that I think really needs to be stressed is you can't negotiate on behalf of your client well if you don't understand them, their motivation and what's going on now. And I think it's more important than ever. You know, sometimes we, we pick up this buyer, right? Somebody it's like, we come by them, which however we do, and they see a house and want to write an offer, right? And we don't know if they're approved. We don't know why they want to buy that house. We don't know what the urgency is. And maybe we get it under contract and we're going and sitting on an inspection. That's real time and you know, real money that we're throwing in there. And then when it comes time to negotiate, I don't know, we don't know the first thing even about our client to know what to, what's coming down the pike. So, so I think that consultation and really knowing like what are, what are the sticking points for them going to be and taking them out of the way on the front end? Oh, it's, it's hugely important. And I can tell you that in my own business, the times that I've had a deal fall in my lap um, where I didn't have to go, you know, where I, I did what you just talked about and we rushed into buying a house, there was always a problem. And I can look back at it um, and kind of judge myself and say, why did this happen? And I can say it's because I didn't know, I didn't spend the time to get to know my client well enough. And somewhere around the line, whether it was true or not, I dropped the ball in their mind. And uh, one of my other favorite terms is perception is reality. Um, so someone's perception of you and what happened in that transaction is their reality, whether it's true or not. Um, and once you lose somebody like that, you're not going to um, get them back. So spend the extra time up front, understand them, get to know them, and then one of the other important things is if you do have something that's moving really fast, a home inspection is three hours long and it is a great time to get to know your client um, if you haven't yet. You know, talk to them, figure them out, um, understand everything. There's no, you know, to me, I hate sitting in the silence. So I don't want to sit in a home inspection and just stare at people I don't know. I'd rather just get to know them. 
Chris, I have learned um, when people call us and, you know, out of the blue, we don't know who they are. We don't know if they're pre-approved. I have learned that it is number one to get a pre-approval and I send them to a lender. I don't talk to them one more minute. Either they are approved and we will sit down with them or they're not and goodbye. Or, or how do we get you approved? Absolutely. And I can tell you that, you know, I've watched these things happen. And a lot of people, a lot of newer agents, I would say, and this is not a knock on anybody, want to skip steps because they're so excited to have a client. Um, if your client can't afford to buy a house, are they your client? Right? I mean, so you're not losing a client by making them get pre-approved and by making them helping them get pre-approved. You're going to take them to your most valued lender. So you're putting them in the right hands, right? You're doing what's best for them. They can't buy a house unless they're pre-approved. So it makes sense that we would help them get pre-approved so that they can buy a house. And that's what I always tell people. I mean, we tell our, our agents on our team all the time, hey, does that client have a pre-approval? No. Well, they're not your client. They're not a buyer. Um, it's just, there, there's just no way to know, right? And there, so don't waste time and get that pre-approval. That's perfect. What else we got? I think you need to call on a couple more people. Okay. Let's call on Jared. Hello. Um, I think I learned a lot that it's just important to ask lots of questions and figure out their true motive because in the end, if you don't, you're gonna wasting both parties' times and not helping right. anybody out. Yeah, and you can't you can't do the service that you need. You can't be someone's fiduciary if you don't understand what they actually need and everything about them. Don't cut corners, um, learn them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, let's see, what else? Gail, I don't think we've called on you yet. No, but I'm not going to let you see me because I was working out <laughs> before I got on here. So, but I do have a question. Actually, I'm going to be putting in an offer on a um, home and the, I'm with the buyer. The sellers are, um, they need to close as quick as possible because they also need their money out of the house in order to to uh, get their next house, which they don't have yet, okay? And my people have not put their house up yet. They don't need to do it, but they would prefer not to have two payments, you know, every month if they can help it. So the other part of this is the, um, my buyers also have um, two children that are going to be graduating. Um, so they want to stay in their home until like the end of May, the beginning of June. So they said they could handle two months of double payments, but they'd like to push it out to 60 days. Um, the, the seller's like, well, I don't know about the 60 days because we've got to take money out. So we were thinking, you know, maybe closing in 30, but and then making the seller pay rent to my buyers to offset the difference. Um, but they weren't really thrilled about it, but um, they also don't have a lot of offers. So um, I, I have a little more leeway on this one. So and any suggestions um, on how to handle this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it sounds like you're on the right path already. You're having the right conversation with them. Um, but there's a couple of things you can do, you know, so you could figure out what the rent would be, what the rent would be that make your buyers happy. And you could actually submit an offer with that lowered to the seller, you know, maybe it's $5,000. Right. So, you know, I thought of that too. Yeah. Um, Cause good. sometimes it's just a, it, sellers can be funny, right? They, they've lived in a house for a long time. They don't want to pay someone rent for the house they lived in. It's, it's an emotional um it's an emotional thing. It's not really yes. a rational um, side of things. Um, and the other side of it is you could do, all right, well, we're going to give you X amount of days for free. 
Um, if you go past these days, you now owe us a basically a per diem per week on top of that. But we're willing to let you do that up until a longer period of time to actually give them um, some leeway and comfort into finding their new home. Okay. You know, kind of sweeten the deal a little bit and try to, because obviously that's what sellers are worried about. What if I can't find a house right. and I'm going to be homeless? Um, your people are in a better position that they don't need to be out and actually want to be in their house until June. Right. Um, so you could use that to, to win the offer and just say, hey, we're willing to give you up until X amount of time, but for free. After that, you have to pay for it, but we can also extend that time if you don't find what you're looking for. Okay, great. Thank you. You could do it. Appreciate it. Gail? Yeah. You could extend the possession time on your listing. And I don't have a listing. When what? you get the listing, you can extend oh. when you put their house up for sale. Oh, yes. Uh huh. Extend that possession. Yeah, I can do that. I'm not worried about that side of it. You're I'm just about worried about the front. Thing. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Anybody else have any more Thanks. questions, comments, concerns? Ahas? I have a question. Now, it's not that I wasn't paying attention, <laughs> but I was going through some old emails, long story. But anyway, before I go into that tangent, um, I, I saw my email that Keller offers concierge is now in Cleveland. Do you guys have Keller offers, like offers as well as concierge, or is it just the concierge? Um, so I can answer that real quick to, to clarify for everybody. There is, um, if you're not familiar with the iBuyer phenomenon or the instant offer phenomenon, there is uh, part of the Keller platform now is an offers um, portal that you can on a listing appointment say, hey, we have access to this opportunity for you to sell your house immediately. Um, as I understand it, Keller Concierge, which is a, a subset of that, has launched in Northeast Ohio. Um, it is, and I, and I will say this, um, even though we're on a recorded line, a lot of times in Keller Williams, we launch things before they're actually able to be accessed. Like about three months ago, we launched a nationwide expansion network that is just now taken in its first member. So um, Latrice, you and I can connect offline because uh, I know you probably have experience with it from your time in Nevada or Nevada rather. Uh, and so, um, that is, uh, that's something that we can, we can talk about and is where we're at in that cycle in Northeast Ohio. Okay. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Also, since I was talking this whole time, I can say that um, we'll also buy your house at the Chase Group. <laughs> if you need a cash offer, immediately call us. <laughs> um, that's awesome because my biggest um, open-ended question is what would you do with a cash offer on your home? That's a good and, question. Yeah. And that gets people to start thinking because a lot of people think, oh, what would I do if it's FHA or VA? Like they're thinking about loan opportunities. But, you know, when you ask someone, well, what would you do if someone just dropped cash in front of your face? That's a good question, right? It makes everybody wonder. I'm sure we're all thinking about that right now in our own houses. <laughs> Yeah, so I'll keep that in mind. What What is it, the Chase Group? Yeah. Okay. Just get a hold of me. <laughs> Anybody else have anything? Well, I don't. I don't have any more for you guys other than know your documents. Um. <laughs> can't be said enough. It really can't, can't be said enough. I mean, the number, and I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll echo that the number of calls that I take from agents who have questions about what's going on in a deal. The first question I'm always going to ask is what does it say in the contract? What is, cause it's not, it doesn't matter what somebody says over the phone. It doesn't matter what somebody says in a text message. It matters on what was signed. 
what was in the document that was signed. Did it say that there's going to be stuff going on with the septic? Great. Then you're fine, right? And if you know the contract and somebody else doesn't, your advantage doesn't get you out of the blue. You just have to, you have to teach at that point. Well, funny. One, one last thing that this just reminded me of, um, I submitted on a listing I had, we got an offer. I submitted a counter offer changing the dates. Um, I text the agent, emailed the agent with it um, saying that, hey, I changed the dates and this and that. Um, we go, we're in closing for like three weeks. And uh, I say, hey, you know, we're, 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 I haven't heard anything about our closing date. And she's like, well, we're not closing till X. And I said, no, that's incorrect. And uh, she goes and looks at the contract and she, she calls me and yells at me. And she goes, you changed the contract. I said, yeah, it was called a counter offer. I said, you're I said, your uh, buyers initialed next to the changes where I had put marks for them to initial. And uh, she just got really quiet. Well, I mean, it just didn't, she didn't read the contract. She didn't understand the contract, um, which obviously was um, embarrassing for her. Um, but, you know, it was just one of those things where we pushed it, we let it go because we wanted the house to close. It didn't matter. It's going to close a couple of weeks late, but it's just, it's embarrassing. She had to go tell her, buyer that she has to put next we have to write an extension now because she didn't know what she read <laughs> and had them sign so pay attention and i know that we have a lot of people who are in their first year two three years in the business nancy i know you're in your first 35 years in the business here so this one's <laughs> for you as well um chris what do you when you if you get an offer from that same agent on a different property what i mean you know confidence level conversation with your buyers like what's going through your head at that point low confidence level is low um i'm going if i have multiple offers i'm gonna i'm gonna tell my client i'm gonna say hey i had a bad experience with this agent i don't feel like she's got everything that she needs to be doing this offers the same um i think i'd go with this one mm -hmm. yeah. um and that's and obviously that is a big deal i mean i've had um, agents tell us that the only reason why they chose our offer was because they knew that we were good agents. Yeah. Um, and if you can relay that to your clients, I mean, they're going to, you, you're going to have a client for life and all their friends and family. Um, cause they're going to, what, what does everybody want? They want to get the house that they want and they don't want to be at disadvantage doing so. And your agent can put you at a disadvantage. That's a, that's a, yeah, we talk, people want to talk about brand during the marketing classes. You're building a brand every time you do a transaction yep. and your brand with the other agents is just, just as if not more important. Um, you know, I'll go back to the thing we were talking about earlier, Chris, about the, you know, negotiations not looking like they are on TV. When you get somebody who's going to nibble or nickel and dime or, or that's going to play hardball uh, and be really aggressive, same situation, right? Like, do you want to work with this person? Or are they a bully every single time you've dealt with? Them? So don't be that guy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you should every I mean, for two reasons. One, every agent you should be making friends with every code broke um, during the transaction. One is because it's going to help you make that transaction go smoother. It's going to give you a good reputation. And two, you never know when they might want to leave that brokerage and come to yours. So if you're a good friend of them, they're going to ask you questions about that, right? I mean, let's earn some passive income and you do that by being a good agent. There's, it's actually the easiest way to do it. Recruiting's hard. Being a good person isn't. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Well, Chris, thank you so much for uh, giving us, uh, lending us your time and talents this morning. I'll be following up to collect the treasures. Um, if you could put your information in the chat, Chris, so that if anybody wanted to reach out, well, guys, we're going to send out the slide deck, uh, and, um, thank you all for joining, participating and taking advantage of ignite. Uh, and we'll be, uh, we'll be back at you next week, uh, with some different training. Have a great day, everyone.